Hello, welcome to Many Beal. This will be part 18 of my deconstruction of um, Keith Frankish's lecture series on illusionism. And my God, part 18, man. This is going to be a long haul, right? Okay, so be it. No problem. I'm, uh, I'm not in the, uh, if it takes 127 parts, so be it, right? I have to get through this. Because I find that getting a grip on metaphysics is very, very important because it's the starting point of your philosophy. So it's like, if you have a direction you need to go and the starting point is incorrect, it doesn't matter if your direction is correct because you're not going to end up in the right place. It's sort of some, something like that, right? If, if you're, f it's, I think it's impossible to do philosophy other than building it on your foundational ideas of how things work. You say, okay, how does this fit with my picture, my mantra, my understanding, right? Then the explanation has to be this. It's, it's impossible not to do that. Because it, I think it's just a need to... You can't do philosophy in, in sort of a floating without direction, right? It's just not what it's there to do, right? It's, it's, it's to make some kind of sense. And the sense you're trying to make is how does things hang together in this picture of mine, right? And it seems like I'm, I'm always in this um, experience. So why shouldn't it sort of make sense in a broader perspective where everything hangs together? Because I'm always in this experience, so, so it's all I have. So it sort of falls out of the, the idea of things that every, every ex, ex, all I can think of and reach conclusions about and everything basically has to be in a bigger coherent picture. There's nothing that should sudden stick in a weird direction compared to the rest of my thinking, right? At least that's my approach. And that's my sort of justification for whether or not it's good philosophy. But if the whole philosophy is based on some kind of foundational understanding, then if that foundational understanding is not correct, the rest of my thinking should be sort of scrapped, right? So that's why I'm saying the importance of having this settlement of your metaphysics is of utmost importance, right? That's why I'm taking things like this very seriously. Now, I'm not saying I'm taking it seriously in that I am uh, very fond of his arguments here. There might be a few things, uh, notches of things here and there where I say, well, well that's an interesting uh, avenue, right? But the foundations is incorrect he's working from, right? And it's actually deeper than that which he's talking about, right? He ha he's working from a mantra, which is, I have direct experience of something that is external to my mind, right? That's what he's, wo he's working from that axiom without realizing it, without axiomizing it, without philosophizing it, right? It's just there as it's given to him. And he's sort of just working from that idea without realizing he actually have to some kind of argue for it or at least say, I am working from this axiom. And if he was stating that axiom, it would be much easier for me to say, well, then I don't have to listen, right? Now that he's not axiomizing anything, but just throwing words at me, I have to deconstruct it to see what is he actually doing? What is he actually saying, right? And this is also one of the things I think that gives a philosophy a bad name is that they're just throwing words at you, right? At some point, these philosophers, they just say, I don't know what you're saying, man. What are you talking about? I need to be able to handle it my, in my everyday life. If I'm standing down in the grocery store, I, I can't go through six hours of, of lectures on illusionism to, to figure out whether or not I should buy that banana, right? So it's like um, coming down from the castles into reality is some, uh, some kind, sometimes hard for these uh, academics because they live in their abstractions, as obviously Keith uh, Richards here 
<laughs> that was right, uh, Keith Frankish. Um, uh, and this, it's so obvious from this drawing here, abstractions, it's circles, it's a uh, paint, it's uh, drawings and, and, and cockwheels and, and some branches and it's sort of, it's, it's all abstractions, abstractions, right? So it's disconnected from any everyday reality. And in my opinion, what connects you with reality is your qualia. It's through qualia that you are in connection, let's say, connection in without further, you know, clarification of what I mean by that. That's the connecting point. All your abstractions, you can juggle them around as much as you want, right? Trying to establish these levels of, you know, uh, reductionism, right? All you want. But at the end of the day, when you open your fridge, right? You also open your eyes, have your uh, alert your ears, and you taste your pickles and so on, right? That's real. That's reality. That's the connection to reality. If anything is reality, right? And then he goes into his office, and then he forgets all about his qualia and and juggles around his abstractions, right? Thinking that abstractions is going to cl clarify him. Uh, he's so sort of there are so many nice abstractions that this sort of these tastes and colors they're just sort of a annoying uh, you know additions that is sort of let's get rid of them they're just sort of everyday uh, basic you know poor people stuff right <laughs> oh man and uh, but I have rewinded a bit here right I rewinded maybe uh, half a minute or so just to make sure that i get uh you know connected to what he talked about the last time and see if we can get get further into the picture here right so so let's dive in of the physical world so with features with, with, with uh, features of the brain in a lawful way um so the idea is this that um let's say oh, oh yeah just uh, this law this fetishism with laws in materialism, right? I don't like that, right? It it smells like communism to me, right? Or totalitarianism. There's a law that says. So now it has become a law in science. Now you obey the law, right? You obey the laws of nature, right? Fuck you, man, right? It's not a law. Well, what a law is some guy with a gun telling you you should do this or do that, right? Because he thinks it's okay. He has an opinion that people should do this and they goddamn should do it or they can be shot, basically, right? That's a law, right? I don't like laws in philosophy, right? Just like people calling uh, Hume's Isard Gap, uh, Hume's Law, right? It's, it's this, uh, you know, power, you know, this striking, smiting down the uh, wrongdoers for disobeying the laws, right? Fuck that. Um, and it, it just goes to show that this thing with laws have become subconsciously the approach of when they step out of themselves and become social, as it, it, the highest level of the hierarchy is the social, right? That's where society is, right? When you are elevating yourself into being subordinate to some kind of Woo, woo society which doesn't really exist only in his conceptual abstractional mind right and this is the 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 what's it called the pitfall of these abstractions because there's no control in how many abstractions you can add to this fucking picture right because you're disconnected from these qualia and all of a sudden, society exists, and governments exist, and nations, and, you know, all sorts of abstractions that there are no fucking empirical data for, right? What is a government? What is it? Show me a picture of a government, right? Then you'll show me a picture of a building, or a person, or what? That's not a government, that's a person, or a building, a stack, a pile of, you know, bricks, right? So when people live in abstractions, I'm in the camp that says, 
don't do that, right? You need abstract, you need to cognize from your, uh, uh, you, and you will unbearably do that because that's how your mind works, that you are extracting elephant from your experience or from your qualia. But that cognition and abstraction from that cognition can also turn into a unicorn, for instance, right? You can take a, a, you know, a horn from that animal and put it on another animal, conceptually, and create a unicorn. Now, that's conceptually fine because you're not violating any concept or subconcept that doesn't, can't be experienced. You can experience a horn, you can experience a horse, but you can't experience... I haven't yet, let's say that, that way, I haven't yet experienced a horse with a horn. So until I do, they don't exist to me, right? Just because I can create an abstraction that, or a concept based on these abstractions that is put together this way doesn't mean I have to consider it an existence, right? Just like social and, and uh, government and, and family and all these things, right? The, these are abstractions. They have nothing to do with empiricism, right? And that's actually incredible that these people who are sort of science, science, scientific and, and, and support a scientific, materialist, physicalist approach to the world, they are so hung up on laws and government and families and society and, and uh, social order and, and uh, you know, all these things that are completely... In empirical, right? Unempirical. What's the word? Unempirical? In empirical? Unempirical, I would think, right? It's ridiculous. When do they sort of lose the marbles and they go into these sort of weird abstractions, right? And that's the danger. Don't disconnect yourself from your qualia because those qualia were the ones who were responsible for you in the first place being able to make these abstractions, right? So you can't just leave the qualia by the wayside. Now I got my abstractions. Now I have got what I need. What? Right? It doesn't work. And he does. He looks into his fucking refrigerator, and he looks. He looks for his pickles, right? He's looking at it. He's using his qualia, man, right? Ah, okay. Let's go. We assume that the, the phenomenal properties. Uh, correlate with certain brain states. When you're in a certain brain state, the state that's that's um, occurs when you see something um, uh, blue, then you uh, uh, have a, uh, um, a blue uh, quality. You're acquainted with phenomenal blueness. And it's that's not reductively explicable. Everything about your brain, the fact that the complex state that your brain is in at that moment, uh, the state of perceiving something uh, blue in, in the world, that all that can be reductively explained in, in, in terms of... Uh, it's kind of uh, this analogy is makes... It, this is uh, screwed up, this, this uh, presentation, that sort of... It's sort of a side stuff. It, it's an add-on with these fancy colors. Don't trust it. It's just... It's outside my, my abstractive reduction base, a reduct, reductive structure here, right? Uh, it's like saying, if you want to look at a... Hmm, I'm trying to figure out a good way to make an analogy. But it's something like, if you look at a house, right? You can say that's the whole house, okay. And then there are sort of rooms in this house. And there are sort of... There are also, you know, the, the, the roof, uh, the, the first floor, the ground floor, the, the, the basement and the attic and, you know, whatever, right? And you can make this sort of reduction and you can reduce it to bricks and the bricks can maybe be, you know, reduced to lumps of clay or, you know, something like that. And then saying, well, there are no, you know, there are no, uh, uh, well, what's it called? Um, there are no carpenters, There's, there are no bricklayers here, right? When you look at that house, there are no bricklayers, right? So why do we need bricklayers? We have the house already, right? We don't need the tractors, we don't need the whatever, all this stuff, right? But there wouldn't be a house in the first place if you didn't have these people and stuff and tools and so on 
to create it, right? So he's just saying, well, yeah, there's some, you know, carpenter stuff over there, but it's not needed. I have my house here, right? It's sort of the same kind of thinking. It's stupid, man. It, it's really stupid. It's the most, the best technical word I can put on it, right? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, cellular processes and uh, chemical processes and so on. But this, having this experience of phenomenal blueness, that can't. That's just, it's just a brute fact that when your brain is in that... I think I commented on that be, uh, in the last chapter, in the last part of mine. What's the difference between blue and phenomenal blue, right? He makes apparent an in, implicit distinction here, which he doesn't e elaborate on. It's as if that is also given to us, right? No, blueness is blueness, right? There's no, there's no going behind blue and say that's why it's blue. That's the problem. That's the, what the hard problem tries to point out. There is only correlation of potential correlation between some, you know, electrodes on a brain that says when you experience blue, this part of your brain lights up, right? But that's correlation. There's no explanation in whatever, uh, you know, standard model of uh, quantum mechanics or the, the, the four forces of nature and so on. Uh, whatever you can dig up from scientific description of reality that necessitates the experience blue, right? Or any other kind of uh, sense data, right? Or qualia. There's nothing that explains why it should be blue. It seems like it's completely disconnected. And the point that idealists are trying to point out that you have got it wrong. The whole thinking that leads to this confusion about qualia is because there's a fundamental flaw in the thinking, the metaphysical foundation, right? And he actually points it out very well here. I can't figure out where this blue fits into this abstract, abstract reduction I have created. So I'm just going to say I don't need it, right? And, and that's, uh, that's fucking dangerous, right? It's a dangerous kind of doing philosophy. It's sort of, if you uh, buy a complicated, you know, uh, cupboard in Ikea, and there's sort of a, a piece of wood and a few screws there, you know, or, you know, you're building a rocket to the moon, right? And you're following the guide, and there's, then there's a sort of a, a few bolts and uh, bits and pieces lying there and you have sort of I think it's okay there's, there's these I don't need those over there right it's just some extra stuff I don't need it right let me fly to the moon right I'm like nah nah I don't think so right it's all and it's not in this case it's not just a bit of pieces right it's basically the foundations the, it's the rocket fuel right it's like, no, 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 that fuel thing, we don't need that, right? <laughs> a highly complex physical state, all of which can be reductively, can be reductively explained, you have this, uh, this particular quality, this particular phenomenal property, uh, phenomenal blueness. And that's just a fundamental law of nature. It can't be further explained. It just happens that way. And then, it, again, of course, there's a similar fundamental... Yes, there you pointed out something important. It cannot be further explained. Blueness cannot be further explained. That should ring a bell, man, right? It's foundational. That's why you can't explain it any further. It's foundational because you can't get to something deeper than your qualia. Your qualia is the first level experience of whatever, the closest step towards reality. Then there's no going closer because you can't define it by something that is deeper than that. You can't explain blue. Well, how would you explain it, right? And that's what confuses him. He needs this kind of a reductive, abstract picture of the world. That's more important to him. Uh, otherwise, he thinks that science is going to, you know, being sidetracked or something, right? So he would rather throw his qualia in the street than to, you know, challenge his own mental picture of what is going on, right? 
and that's um, that says a lot about uh, when 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 you cannot challenge your own ideas, right? That that when you do this sort of Cartesian doubt experiment, you could say, right? At some point, it 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 says a lot about your will or your ability to challenge your own ideas, right? He's only he cannot go any deeper than this picture. It has to be the case. He will not challenge that. So whatever challenge it, he will he will you know throw it to the wolves, right? He will throw it out and say, no, no, it doesn't fit my picture here. It doesn't fit. It's, it's an illusion. Get out, get rid of it, right? So fundamental or when you're in the state that uh, uh, when your when your brain is in the state of of um, um, perceiving something uh, yellow then you're acquainted with phenomenal yellowness and uh, when it's in the state of perceiving something uh, red you're in the state of perceiving something you, uh, you when your brain is in the state of perceiving something red you have uh, uh, an experience of phenomenal redness and so on phenomenal yeah can he says it when you experience red you have an ex uh, 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 what how does uh, frame it? When there's red, you have phenomenal red. But you don't have red and then phenomenal red. How do you get to the redness if if phenomenal red is that which you are experiencing the qualia? What is the other thing? How do you have access to that man? Right? Who are you? Well, what kind of access is it? It's just given to you. Where does it come from? How does it enter you? Right? If you're working from this outside inside uh, dichotomy, right? So you already you, it's like it's almost like he's saying I always have the, I have this big picture outside which has been described by science. And then there's this weirdness going on inside these skulls, right? That's not important. It's just a weird reflection of this big perfect picture I have out here. But how the hell did he get to that perfect picture out there without using his fucking mind? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Green, purple, um, brown, and so on. For every every uh, color you might experience, every shade of every color, every degree of intensity of every, of, of, of every shade, and so on. And all of these are fundamental laws which can't be further explained and so, so we're going to have um an awful lot of these these laws similarly for for other sense modalities for uh, hearing a certain musical uh, uh um, note again when your brains when your auditory system is in a certain state then you have a certain auditory phenomenal experience and again it's just a fundamental law that this that this phenomenal state accompanies that brain state again for other uh, for every musical uh, for every sound you can you can you can uh, distinguish this is a confusion picture right it's like uh, the from the neural state of the brain mental state whatever arrives three different colors which turns into another three shades of colors which turn into music <laughs> something like it's just a weird presentation. Yeah, he's just sort of, there. okay, there's not only colors, there are also sounds and, you know, possibly taste and so on, whatever he's going with, right? But the presentation here, colors doesn't turn into sound. Why do you present it like this? It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's stupid, man. <laughs> I, I lack good words to present how I, you know, how I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded by it, right? It's like, the, it's just, yeah, color, sound, uh, the, that's bullshit over there. Yeah, no, let me stay with my concepts over here, right? And then again, for things like textures, feeling textures and so on and so on. Again, for every possible experience you might have there's a fundamental law linking it to the corresponding brain state and none of these laws can be reductively explained maybe there might be a way of introducing some sort of uh, um, uh, system system systematicity to these laws maybe some of them could be uh, expressed more slightly more economically but none of them can be reductively explained 
They're all fundamental laws, and so there are going to be millions upon millions of these fundamental laws linking specific complex brain states with specific, specific uh. highly complex brain states with specific simple phenomenal properties. So it's a, what, what is being linked here by these fundamental laws is a very, very complex brain state involving activity among billions of neurons and a very simple phenomenal property, the property of seeing phenomenal blueness of some shade or whatever. And uh, Herbert Feigl coined this term nomological danglers for these things. Danglers because they sort of hang from, they sort of... There it is again, he likes these... these f fancy words, right? That sort of slaps you a bit in the face and, and sort of indirectly tells you you're stupid, right? Nomological danglers? Get the fuck out of here, man, right? Just, you know, throwing these weird terms at me, like nomological danglers. Herbert Feigl, who the hell is that, man? I don't care about Herbert. I care about good documents. You can't just say nomological danglers, right? As if that proves anything. It's annoying. Dangle from the physical picture. They're not integrated with it. They just hang from it um, uh, as external add-ons. And nomological because they're um, related uh, to the physical world in a law-like nomological way. Okay. So, I mean, that's one picture you could have. But I, I think it's a very... I don't think it's very economical or very... Um, uh, elegant picture, and this was expressed by the um, uh, Anglo-Australian philosopher J.J.C. Smart um, in a famous paper, <laughs> Smart. Um, uh, Sensations and Brain Processes, and he said this, I cannot believe that ultimate laws of nature, fundamental laws, could relate simple constituents, the phenomenal properties, to configurations consisting of perhaps billions of neurons, and goodness knows how many billion billions of ultimate particles that compose the billions of neurons and then billions of basic physical particles that um, compose uh, the, the brain. No, but what you need to realize is that when you're talking about constituents and configurations and neurons and particles, you are talking about mental abstractions or models that are based ultimately at some point maybe as a memory of some qualia right and a model of something is not the thing right if you have an idea of a particle and you're saying that particle is outside your mind then what you're experiencing or what is re representing that particle or the particle that is a representation representation of something is not the thing itself then right because the particle is not both in your mind and out there if you're saying it's out there, right? So if you have a representation of it, that representation which you call a particle is not the thing it's representing, right? Otherwise it would be same, the same as saying that the photograph of the moon is the moon, right? You, it, it's this, you want your cake and eat it too, right? You can't both say it's out there and it's also in there, right? You, you. It's like <clears throat> I have my abstractions, and they are outside my mind. Mine also must be inside your mind, otherwise you wouldn't be experiencing these concepts or whatever, right? But if they are inside your mind, how do you know they are also outside your mind? Because you need to have that experience inside your mind in order to reference them, right? And this dichotomy of the inside and the outside combined with these representations in your mind is so confusing apparently that this naive realism is so hard to circumvent because the mind simply won't it's almost like the mind refuses to go there right because it's it's it goes against you know common thinking what's the word right um that you are you are referring to that which you experience as the actual outside while it can't be it must be in your mind if you're creating this inside outside dichotomy right otherwise you would be a solipsist and then why are you talking to yourself right i mean come on man you can't have it both ways such ultimate laws would be like nothing so far known in science 
They have a queer smell to them. I'm just unable to believe in the nomological danglers themselves or in the laws by which they would dangle. Um, so I, again, that doesn't... Sh uh, I'm not, I need to read this. JJC Smart. I never heard of this guy. But that, that's a, that doesn't invalidate anything as such. It's just like, again, this feeling of he's cherry picking from all sorts of obscure sources, potentially, right? He's not referencing Immanuel Kant, for instance, which was very deep into metaphysics, right? Or Schopenhauer, maybe, uh, you know, right? Plato, whatever. No, it's some kind of modern philosopher nobody has heard about, right? So he's basically cherry picking. That's what a sense I get, right? Okay, he says, I cannot believe, no, but what you believe is, I, I'm, I don't care about your beliefs, right? Give me a fucking argument, right? What, what are your axioms? What, 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 what are you basing your statements on, right? What's your basic metaphysics, right? Give me, give that to me so I have something to reference, right? I cannot believe that, but don't give a fuck about your beliefs, right? To be quite frank. Beliefs are, you know, shove it up your beehole, right? Uh, nature could relate simple constituents to configuration consisting of perhaps billions of neurons and goodness, know, goodness knows how many billions of billions of ultimate particles. Such ultimate laws would be like nothing so far known in science. <gasps> oh, so known in science? Well, science doesn't give you knowledge, right? You need to fucking understand what you're doing when you're doing science. These philosophers, sort of semi-scientific, semi-philosophy, sort of between two chairs there, right? They think that they know what science is, know that they understand what science does. They apparently don't because they have apparently never done any science. They just read about science and they think that science gives you knowledge. That's also putting the cart before the horse, right? Because you need knowledge in order to do science, right? I mean, it's... a uh, oh man. Ah, oh man. These are actually very interesting times because metaphysics was put on... was sidetracked at the end of the, the, the 19th century, right? In the early, 20th, uh, early 19th century... A lot of, uh, uh, you know, following Immanuel Kant and so on, there was a lot of um, idealism and that was sort of maybe turned into communism, right? And then there was a fight between communism and, and, and freedom, right? And freedom lost, apparently. But as we are getting close to science having huge, there are central questions that seems to be impossible to answer, right? And it sort of, it, it was working well for a hundred years or so, right? Now we're running into problems that there are so big questions that seems to be unanswerable. And at the same time, this, the old school metaphysics has been subdued and is now time to grow back and say, maybe we should take another look at metaphysics rather than thinking that science answers any, everything, right? Basically, science answers nothing, right? It just gives you a sort of qualified crystal ball about what might happen in the future, right? That's all science does. And then it compares one object with another object and says this object is so many units of that other, other object quantified, right? And then try to predict how these objects are going to move about if they are in a certain scenario. That's all that happens in science. You creating all these elaborate abstractions and levels of reduction and so on within abstractions has nothing to do with metaphysics, right? In my opinion. The metaphysics is about how do you approach the understanding of how do you understand your experience? How do you use your illusion, right? How do you use your experience? What do you do with it? And basically no one can tell you, right? Because it's up to you to figure out you are your own philosopher, right? 
Don't trust that some academic idiot is going to tell you how to understand your experience. They don't even like this guy who's basically saying, don't trust your illusions, right? Don't trust your experience. It's, um, it has, it has to be sort of, it, it almost like I wanted every, every, all academia to fucking be blown up, right? Just go away with all your fucking science and bullshit, right? And let's start fresh, right? Start from a fresh and say, no, no, no. Let's figure out how to approach this from a fucking foundation, right? And if we start from a foundation, we might figure out that we disagree at some point, right? Fine. And let's create two camps then, right? Where, where you go over there with your axioms and we stay here with our axioms. Fine. Let's not inflict our, each other's axiom on each other. I fucking hate democracy where people have to follow along the same ideas. It's stupid, man. You have to accept that people have different approaches to experiences. And if he wants to go around and say, I don't trust my uh, qualia, fine. Just get the fuck away from me, right? Or let me get away from you. Don't force me to pay for your life, man, right? Get the fuck out of my face, right? Hmm. Show that the view is is uh, is uh, impossible, uh, but it does show that it's a kind of it's a kind of theoretic. And and also this smart guy, I I, I don't understand what he's trying to say. Such ultimate laws would be like nothing so far known in science. No, they have a queer smell to them, a queer smell. Fuck off, man. I'm just unable to believe. Again, there's this belief. It's not about belief, man, right? Nomological danglers themselves or in the laws whereby they would dangle? What the fuck, right? Oh. Okay, cost come on. Uh, another option for the phenomenal realist is, and one that's become... Um, oh, let me, sorry, before I go into that, let, let me mention another uh, problem here. Um, the problem of causal closure, it's, it's an extension of the problem we've just been discussing. Um, okay, so it seems obvious that phenomenal properties, if they were real, would, would have effects on us. If being in pain, if what it is to be in pain is to be acquainted with pain qualia, then it seems pain qualia must, must have an effect on us. I mean, pain has an effect on us, and if that's what... And if pain consists in uh, having pain qualia, then pain qualia must have an effect on us. But it's really hard to uh, to justify that uh, intuition if we have this picture of um, phenomenal properties as add-ons to the to, to the physical um, to the physical to, uh, to the physical world. Okay, there's a lot of sort of uh, he sort of slides under the door here, right? It seems obvious, right? These sort of fluffy. You know, it seems off obvious. Seems? Is that a good argument, right? That the phenomenal properties of experience have effect on us. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, he's not saying, he's not stating anything. This is what I'm going with. It's more like, it seems obvious, right? So you're sort of, he's not saying it outright. He would always be able to back out because it's only seeming. But he wants you to accept it as some kind of axiomatic statement. So he's sort of, sort of half-ass, uh, you know, weak, uh, you know, backbone kind of argument, right? He doesn't want to step up to the plate and say, this is how it is, right? He wants to say, it seems obvious, right? And also, but it appears that all changes in the physical world can be fully explained. Well, it appears, right? It appears, it's, it's the same as it seems, right? It appears. He's not saying all physical can be fully explained, right? It's, he says it appears that all, the, it's sort of, again, this gray area, weak boned, uh, you know, way of arguing, right? And then the physical world is closed on the causation. What, what does it mean that it's closed? Well, what is closed? What, what, when you're saying the physical world, what are you actually talking about? And 
when you can tell me what you're, what you're talking about, how do you get to it, right? What's your access to it? If you have the inside-outside dichotomy and you're talking about a physical world outside, how the hell do you get to it, right? That keeps cropping up. It's, it's like as it's given to you. It's not given to you, man, right? You have to experience it somehow. And what do you use to those, for those experiences? Your qualia, right? What do you mean it's closed under causation? Causation has been challenged for many a, a millennia or century, right? Since Hume. You can't experience causation either, right? You're gluing things together without pointing out where the hell that glue is, right? The billiard table, right? But where is the causation you're referring to? You're just saying, yeah, 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 this happens. And every time I, you know, bump this uh, billiard ball into that other billiard ball, this is uh, happening. And then you're adding the label causation to it as if there's some extra stuff there, which is causation. But you just invented a word to describe something you are not experiencing. You just want to connect them with this glue you call causation, right? So is there any difference between correlation and causation? Well, it's difficult to argue that there's something higher level, which is causation, right? They say that, you know, correlation is not causation. No, but there's no proof of causation either, right? As Hume correctly pointed out, just because you don't like it to be the case, doesn't mean you can refute Hume just by saying, well, there is causation. It is closed under causation. Ha, oh, man. Because it seems that it looks as if all changes in the physical world can be fully explained in terms of prior states of the physical world. Um, okay, so this winding the clock back, right? Uh, it, it's just a, 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 a clock unfolding since the dawn of time or whatever, right? And everything can be, uh, yeah, it can't be explained. In theory, it could be explained if you knew the position of all, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, all the particles and so on. But again, those particles and those systems and that reality you're referring to, that is a mental representation of what potentially is going on out there based on your qualia. These are representation, right? It's like saying that the whole universe can be explained by the photographs I made of the universe, right? So I have all these photographs here on my floor and it explains everything. There's, you can always take a photograph. But it's not the real thing then if it's a photograph, right? <laughs> <sighs> and who says that five senses, uh, you know, hearing, uh, smell, taste, and uh, color, and so on, right? That is sufficient to describe everything. Why is it not six senses, or three senses, or 25 senses, right? And what about an infinite number of senses, right? What if you have one more sense, would it be a more precise picture? So why is it five senses that is perfect, right? I mean, it's like he hasn't done any rigid thinking in this area at all. He's cherry picking shit in order to come up with some kind of refutation of the hard problem so he can stay in his uh, mental abstraction, right? This just follows from the idea that everything is realized in the basic physical uh, um, uh, states. And that basic physics is complete and closed, nothing into, nothing... Um, uh, no, there's no outside influences on it. Um, and so we, uh, the, the phrase that's used here is to say that the physical world is closed under causation. Uh, nothing from outside the physical world, the world that's, that's realized in basic physics, uh, intervenes to affect what happens within the physical world. Now, you might think, well, what about quantum events? They're, 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 they're inherently unpredictable. Well, that's true, but even they have their probabilities fixed by prior physical states. We may not know which way, which way the, the, um, uh, some quantum event is going to, to turn out, but the probabilities of it turning out one way or another are completely fixed by the preceding states of the physical system. So even there, there's no... It's also this idea that 
you know, you do science in order to create some kind of prediction, which could be a formula or something. And then you say, this formula explains things, right? No, it was your experience of that you call reality that turned into a formula. The formula didn't come before your experience. That formula is a reflection of your experiences, right? That you then say, okay, because of causality, and predicting the future, it usually turns out this way, right? And uh, these rocks have been lying here for uh, 4 billion years, that they're going to be here in 4 billion years also, right? So this formula will work. But the formula is just an abstraction from experience of how these objects appeared, right? So in this kind, it is closed in causation. It is fully predictable. It has been described the first no you are it's just a photograph right the photograph doesn't explain the moon the photograph of the moon doesn't explain anything right it's just a reflection it's a representation right oh. no room for uh there to be any kind of meaningful intervention from outside uh to, to, to make things come out in a way that, that, um, that de uh, defined those probabilities. So it seems this is a problem for phenomenal realists. They want to say that, uh, it, at least if they, like, if they take the add-on view, that phenomenal properties are, uh, uh, are not part of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the physical world itself. How are they going, how are they going to reconcile these, these two claims, that phenomenal properties that the feel of, of pain, say, has a causal effect, and the idea that the physical world is, is closed under causation. Uh, one option would be to say, well, maybe uh, uh, some events uh, have more than one cause. So they, they have this a complete physical cause, say, it's the, the events in the brain that we... Um... No, 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 no. We have to... You have to understand, Mr. Uh, Frankish, how science works. Science trying to get from the smaller picture to the bigger picture. It's not deductive, it's inductive, you could say. Maybe that's the wrong way of putting it. But, then, you know, bear with me, right? When you are creating a theory of how things are unfolding, you are basically saying, okay, I'm trying to create a model of how things are working here, right? And then, I tr then myself and other people will eventually try to shoot it down to point out if it is actually not working. And then maybe from there create a better theory, right? Just like Newton created an idea and then along came some other people, uh, Einstein, and said, no, no, it doesn't work completely. It needs to be adjusted a bit. Yeah, yeah, right. So this theory didn't work and then new theory and then maybe somebody is challenging Einstein at some point, right? So on. What a theory, a... a a hypothesis, you could say, maybe, right? A theory hypothesis, we go into an, a delineation there, but maybe theory is about the past and hypothesis about the future. I, I don't know. That would make sense to classify it thus, right? I, and a hypothesis is an, in, is in a try to explain how things will unfold, like a theory is about how to explain something that has already been unfolding, right? So theories can turn into hypotheses, right? Okay, if you have an hypothesis, is this based on this formula, things are going to unfold. This is a formula, this is an explanation, let's say, that hasn't been refuted yet. Just because it hasn't been refuted yet, doesn't mean that it's perfect, right? The only thing you can say about a, a scientific uh, hypothesis is that it hasn't been refuted yet. That's all you can say. It's not the end all be all, right? It just hasn't been refuted yet. So there's no certainty in science, right? And certainty, philosophical certainty is impossible in my opinion, because you will have to say that everything will be this way in future. You're trying to predict the future by claiming certainty, right? You're, you're playing the ultimate, you know, uh, wise old lady looking in the crystal ball, right? 
So science is, okay, I have an explanation. Try to refute it, right? Okay, I can't refute it. Okay, so let's, let's you know, we could agree that we can work from this. It seems to work so far until we haven't refuted, until that day may come when we refute it and say we have to come up with something better, right? But all these scientific hypotheses are just stories about how things will unfold that hasn't, haven't been refuted yet. That's the right way to see it, in my opinion. So you can't use them as arguments in philosophy, man, right? Because you, in order to come up with all these uh, hypotheses, you needed to have a philosophy. Science is a spin-off from philosophy, right? Science is not explaining philosophy. That's why you can't use any kind of science to explain philosophy or use as a philosophical argument. It's just something that goes on when you try to predict what is going to happen in the future. That is not philosophy, right? Philosophy will tell you what you mean by future. It will, will tell you what you mean by trying to predict, right? What is a prediction? That's philosophy, right? <sighs> uh, that produce the pain reactions. Okay, so when I, I'm in pain, I have... Uh, things happen in my brain and they cause all the pain reactions, the, 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 uh, the crying out and rubbing the affected area and, uh, and physiological reactions, sweating and so on, stress levels and all this. So now they're caused um, by events in the brain. They have a Oh yeah, that's what, what, what I came into that rant just before. That is, there seems to have more cause than they need. They are overdetermined. Well, what I'm hearing is that there might be more than one hypothesis fitting some kind of explanation, right? Well, yeah. Why not? Just because there's one doesn't rule out that there are others, right? It's it's just because it hasn't been refuted yet doesn't mean that it's the only explanation, right? You can never get to a point and say now it is it unrefutable. Now it has been settled. You can't get to that point. You will always be in uncertainty about science because it's about stories that haven't been refuted yet right predictions about the future that haven't been refuted yet the prior the complete um explanation in terms of physical processes in the brain but uh maybe they they also have a cause they also have a phenomenal cause so they have two sets of causes each of which perhaps will be sufficient to, to uh, uh on its own so it's like somebody being, um, okay, somebody's death being uh, due to two things at the same time being, say, shot and... St and it's also this uh, causal closure. Um, he's just, you know, you know, I don't know, this stream of words. It, he's putting me to sleep with it, right? But causal closure, that is sort of, he's trying to put up a wall, right? Just like uh, Donald Trump. He's building a wall between his scientific uh, abstractions and real life, uh, you know, um, qualia, right? There's causal closure. There's a wall here. It's closed. It's closed off. You're an idiot if you try to go beyond the wall, right? Stabbed simultaneously. Okay, so the, uh, they were, the, the event, the death was overdetermined. It, was, it had more causes than it needed. So you could say that, and that would have to be applied quite systematically to all events that seem to be due to, um, to the effects of our experiences. So you could say that, but it looks a bit like a, a move, a, uh, an ad hoc move, a move that's just made to, to save your theory, uh, that these things are both non-physical and causally effective. It's not a very elegant solution again. Uh, another option would be to say, well, maybe the physical world isn't causally closed. Maybe there are interventions from outside it. Um, so perhaps we would, when we look closely enough, we would find some neurons in the brain firing and sending signals without any physical cause at all. Neuroscientists would say, well, we just can't explain why that neuron fired at that moment and send that. It's just there's absolutely no physical explanation for it. And then we could bring in the phenomenal properties to explain it. Well, yeah, that's, it's, it's an option. I don't think we are yet in a position to completely rule it out. But again, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big bet, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence for anything like that at the moment. Um, so it's taking on a big theoretical commitment to say that. 
Another option is to say, well, is to give up on the idea that phenomenal properties actually uh, cause anything. Maybe the feel of the pain doesn't really do anything. It's there and it goes along with the certain brain states, but it's the brain states that are doing all the causal work. The, the pain is just uh, uh, um, comes along for, for the ride, as it were, uh, using a, an analogy from the um, 19th century um, biologist Thomas Huxley, who could say that uh, it's like the, the steam, uh, the, the, the phenomenal properties are like the, the steam from, a, from an engine. It's, 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 they, they, they're produced by uh, the, the physical uh, activity in the brain, but they don't have any effect back on it. Okay, so what's happening in the brain produces these things, but then all the effects that follow are, are due entirely to, the, to, what the, to what the brain is doing, not to these, these side effects that are produced. Again, that's a possibility, but I, I think it's a pretty counterintuitive one. Uh, I mean, given where we start the idea that, that phenomenal properties are supposed to explain what it's like for us and what it's like for us seems to matter to us, seems to make a difference to us, then if we end up having to say, well, what it's like doesn't matter in that way, doesn't make a difference, then, well, we seem to be... Um, we seem to have come quite away from where we started. And again, it seems that our theory here is distorting our, um, uh, our um, initial, uh, the, the picture that we started with. Or finally, of course, you might just say, well, for not these phenomenal properties, actually, they aren't uh, add-ons to the physical picture. They are just actually physical states. They actually are just states that, uh, that are mentioned in that physical description. They are maybe just brain states. They're nothing more than that. They're just patterns of neuron firing, say that's all they are. And it's a mistake to think they're something different. We'll, we'll come on to that one in, 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 in a moment. I, I don't understand why he needs to go here. I, I don't understand it. It's like, I have a sense that he, do, he doesn't understand the hard problem. I don't, and don't and it's like, it's like he seems to be that the, these quaily are just some weird stuff happening, a sort of the 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 the, uh, the, the, the smoke from the chimney, or, or you know the, the the vapor from the 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 the, uh, the, the damp what's it called <laughs> steam train, right? Um, it's just sort of a, a, a byproduct that is useless, right? It, it, no, that's that's not why Chalmers is so hung up this hard problem. It, it's because it's very, very important. It's more like a, a flow of stuff going on. There's things arriving to your mind, and you need your mind to get around things, right? You need the qualia. You can't just say it's it's sort of you're missing a big big, big part of your puzzle, right? You can't just remove the puzzle just because it doesn't fit in fit for you, right? It has to be a part of your explanation why it's there. You can't just say, well, these qualia, which apparently should be very important, right? You can't just re remove them because they are the your access to anything. If you don't have qualia, you have nothing, right? You wouldn't have all these abstractions and, and ideas and models and so on if you didn't have qualia. That I'm firm on, right? So I, I, whenever somebody just re tries to get rid of something that seems to be a central aspect of your experience and, and everything going on, right? Be, be careful, right? I'm not saying don't take it seriously, but, you know, when people just say, oh, just get rid of it, right? Just, yeah, ah, the rock. we don't need the fuel in this rocket. Get away with it doesn't fit i don't like it right doesn't fit my ideas oh man right it's the same mentality with you know well just make some concentration camps right we don't need these people right make some concentration camps to get rid of them right gulag um that one certainly looks the 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 the, the most the simplest um, response to this problem of causal closure but as we'll see there are some problems for that too of course illusionism has a very simple okay i think this uh, going into the next slide we are 20 seconds from the hour mark so share like and subscribe and join the discord otherwise you know 
Hope you enjoy this series uh, and step into the next one in not too far flung future. So see you then. Bye bye.